Welcome to the online narrated lectures for CM2101. This week we will finish our discussion of rotational spectroscopy by first lifting our assumption about the rigidity of bonds and by extending the discussion to include polyatomic systems. We will classify polyatomic molecules and thus identify some of the selection rules that arise as molecules become more complex. Well, everything we've said so far has been about a molecule whose bond is rigid. In part 9, what I want to do is relax that condition. Well, why would I need to relax that condition? We know that bonds aren't rigid. We know that molecules vibrate, for instance. But what is going to happen to a bond as it rotates faster and faster and faster? Intuitively, you know that the bond length is going to get longer and longer and longer. Why does the bond length get longer as we rotate faster and faster? What forces are acting? Indeed, there will be a centrifugal distortion occurring. Now, I don't know whether in school you were told by your teacher that centrifugal distortion doesn't exist. That it is rather a centripetal force rather than a centrifugal force. Well, if this is the case, then what you were told by your teacher was wrong. This cartoon by XKCD relates it rather well. Let me act the role of the protagonist in this cartoon and narrate it for you. How do you like my centrifuge, Mr. Bond? When I throw this lever, you will feel the centrifugal force crush every bone in your body. You mean centripetal force. There is no such thing as centrifugal force. A laughable claim, Mr. Bond, perpetuated by overzealous teachers of science. Simply construct Newton's laws of motion in a rotating system, and you will see the centrifugal force term appear as plain as day. Come now, do you really expect me to do coordinate substitution in my head while strapped to a centrifuge? No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. My sincere apologies. Let's continue on to the science. How is centrifugal distortion going to affect my spectrum, though? Well, if we look at the carbon monoxide data for this spectrum, here are the frequencies of each of these lines. In the final column, I have reported the frequency gap between adjacent lines. Notice this gap is getting steadily smaller. And in fact, the size of these gaps is more rapidly decreasing as we get to higher and higher J values. So, for instance, if I was measuring these lines to only two significant figures, you wouldn't have been able to appreciate that it is not quite, and not always, equidistant. There is only a slight variation, but this data is of high enough quality that we can measure that very slight subtlety incredibly accurately. This data is significant to the sixth decimal place. So we are very confident about this change. But it arises because the bond length is changing. You know that if I go to a higher J level and the bond length changes, this will have an effect on the rotational constant. If the bond length is larger, the moment of inertia is larger, and so my rotational constant is smaller. So it is not surprising that the gap is getting smaller as I go to higher and higher J values. So delta nu, the change in frequency as I go to higher J values, decreases. And that is because the bond length depends on which rotational level you are in. Ultimately, this is because chemical bonds are elastic, they are not rigid. So, if J equals 1, the bond length will be this length, and my molecule will rotate like so. If I go to J equals 2, the bond length will be larger because it is rotating faster. The nuclei experiences centrifugal force which stretches the bond. If J equals 3, the bond length is even longer because it is rotating even faster. So centrifugal force arising from rotation distorts the molecule, stretching the bond slightly. As the rate of rotation increases, the bond length increases, the moment of inertia increases, and so the rotational constant decreases. And it doesn't just have to be a diatomic, it could also be a polyatomic. Here I've drawn ammonia, and if you rotate ammonia around its threefold axis, 
these three hydrogen atoms. will start to rise towards the horizontal plane the faster you rotate it. And in fact this effect will be even more apparent than the stretching of this bond because stretching a bond is a lot more difficult than what is going on here. We are not so much stretching the bond but bending the bond and bending is a lot easier than stretching a bond. Well, it's not actually bending the bond, but the angle between the three atoms is changing, as opposed to changing the bond length, and you refer to that as bending motion. How are we going to improve our model then? We've got to take into account this effect, and we can do so relatively simply. And what we would do is to assume that my bond is allowed to stretch, but it stretches in the same way as a spring stretches. If you have ever put masses on a spring and allowed it to stretch and measured the length, then you would probably have found that the spring obeys what is known as Hooke's law, that the force that you apply will stretch the bond proportional to the force applied, so the displacement is proportional to the force. That leads to what is known as symbol harmonic motion. So essentially what we are going to assume is that my bond behaves as a simple harmonic oscillator. We'll be looking at that in more detail when we discuss vibrations, but we are going to assume the same model for rotation as we will do so for vibration. So we are not going to have my rotational constant changing, we are going to keep the rotational constant that the molecule would have at equilibrium, and we are going to introduce another parameter, which we are going to call the centrifugal distortion constant, which we will give the symbol D. If we solve the Schrodinger equation, where we allow the bond to stretch according to the simple harmonic oscillator model, then this is the expression we come up with. The first term here contains a set of constants which we recognize as B. The rotational term can be found from the energy by dividing through by HC, as we've done here and it reveals the familiar term we got for the rigid diatomic that the rotational term was equal to the rotational constant times j into j plus 1. This b times j into j plus 1 is what we had before but now we have this rather nasty set of parameters here multiplied by j squared into j plus 1 all squared and in the rotational term this is given the symbol d into j squared into j plus 1 all squared. This nasty set of parameters here is my centrifugal distortion constant d. So if I write this in terms of b and d and in terms of wave numbers my energy is equal to b times j into j plus 1 minus d into j squared into j plus 1 all squared. Now notice that my centrifugal distortion d here depends on k and I apologize for the confusion that arises here because this k is not the Boltzmann constant but instead is the force constant. We use the same symbol sadly. So this is the force constant that is how stiff the bond is. If it is very stiff I'd have a large force constant. The centrifugal distortion would therefore be very small, so it won't affect the energy very much. The stiffer the bond, the closer it is to my rigid approximation. However, if my force constant is very small, for instance, if it is a very weak bond, so rotating faster has a big effect on the bond length, then it is going to have a very large effect on my energy. It will change it substantially. If I know the force constant, and if I know its reduced mass, I will be able to determine the frequency of the bond, at what frequency it would vibrate at. Although I'm doing rotational spectroscopy, knowing the force constant would enable me to derive the frequency of the vibration. And that is what you can do here. Because the frequency of vibration is given by this expression according to the simple harmonic oscillator model, if I am able to determine d, the centrifugal distortion constant, from my spectrum, I should be able to determine the force constant.
and if I know the isotopic composition I can calculate the reduced mass mu. This is the standard frequency expression for a simple harmonic oscillator. If you divide 4 times b cubed by d you get the frequency squared. You can confirm this yourself by using the expressions for b and d on the previous slide. So if we are able to determine b and d we can get the vibrational frequency and I'll be returning to this when we discuss vibrational spectroscopy later in this course. The question I want to look at now is how the centrifugal distortion constant changes the appearance of my spectrum. This was the case for my rigid model where my rotational energy term was b times j into j plus 1. Now I've got a new term for my improved model where I've got this additional parameter d and it depends on my j like so. Okay, So we have our original term which is the same for the rigid and non-rigid rotors but you have this additional term which is minus d times j squared into j plus 1 all squared. How does this change things? When j is equal to 0 I haven't made any modifications to the energy because minus d times 0 squared times 0 plus 1 all squared is still 0. In my new improved model my ground state is the same. But if j is equal to 1 my energy term is now not 2b as it was in the rigid rotor but 2b minus 4d and if j is equal to 2 my energy term is no longer 6b it is now 6b minus 36d and the next one will be 12b minus 144d clearly if d is very small this won't be noticeable but if d is large or if the system is in a high j state in a high rotational state you will see this difference and that's what we were seeing in the carbon monoxide spectrum as the gap between spectral lines gets smaller and smaller. In terms of the spectrum, what will this effect look like? Well, this is my rigid rotor spectrum. And this is the spectrum I get for the non-rigid rotor. The lines are at slightly lower frequencies and the gap is getting smaller and smaller as we get to higher J values. Because I know the rotational term from my improved model, I can determine the energy differences in exactly the same way as we did before. I want to know the energy difference between level j plus 1 and level j. That will be f of j plus 1 minus f of j. So that will be 2b into j plus 1, which is what I had before for the rigid rotor, and an additional term which is minus 4d into j plus 1 cubed. I've got this new cubic term. And again you can see why this reduced gap becomes more easily visible as you go to higher j values. It is because the spectral line spacing depends on j plus 1 all cubed. So if j is very large I'll be subtracting a very large value as we go to higher levels. In summary, centrifugal distortion leads to rotational energy levels that are closer together as J increases. Another way we can look at that, qualitatively, it is a similar kind of behaviour we had for a particle in the box. Remember that the energy levels of the particle in the box get closer and closer together as you increase the size of the box. Well in essence what is going on here is that as we go to higher and higher J values the bond length gets larger. It is like my box getting bigger and so the energy levels get closer together. For the same reason, the more space my molecule has or the more space over which my wave function can be spread the smaller the gap will be between my energy levels. 
This improvement to the model, however, has not changed the selection rule or significantly changed the intensity pattern. The selection rule is still that it must have a permanent dipole moment and that the specific selection rule that delta J is equal to plus or minus 1 is still rigorous. The intensity pattern still depends on the Boltzmann distribution just as it did with the rigid rotor. What are representative values for these parameters for a diatomic? My rotational constant is normally in the range of about 1 to 10 wave numbers. It might be slightly smaller than 1, that can occur, but normally it is somewhere between 1 and 10, say. So then, of course, in terms of your spectrum, we're working from, say, 0 wave numbers to 60 or 70 wave numbers when we're looking at a rotational spectrum. So remember, when we're only interested in vibrational spectra, we are working in thousands of wave numbers, and when we're working with electronic spectra, we're working with tens of thousands of wave numbers. What about the centrifugal distortion constant? As I've said, it is very small, of the order of about 10 to the minus 3 wave numbers. So it is 3 to 4 orders of magnitude smaller than B. This is why it is a small adjustment to my first model. So the first model, the rigid rotor model, is a pretty good model. So when we are working with small values of J, it could be that we can ignore this centrifugal distortion term, that the correction term d times j squared into j plus 1 all squared may well be negligible. This is the end of part 9 of this week's online lecture. Please continue on to part 10.